OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. everyone, my name is Marjorie Olavides. I'm a project specialist for the Outreach and Technical Assistance Network, also known as OTAN, and I'd like to welcome you all to this month's OTAN Tech Talk. Our speaker today is Penny Pearson, a distance learning coordinator for OTAN. Her topic today is creating accessible documents. Let's get started. Go ahead, Penny. Thank you, Marjorie. And welcome, everyone. Um, we're here today as Marjorie said, I'm Penny Pearson, and I am a coordinator with OTAN, and I have acquired a passion for accessibility over the past several years as working for OTAN. So we're going to go through this um, basically demonstration first, and I'll give you some information and resources along the way. And at the bottom of the slide here that's showing on the screen is my um, basically a website where I've got some accessibility resources, and I encourage you to go and check it out. There's other presentations there, but you can find the information on uh, accessibility. So I want to give you a little rundown here of what we're going to do. And it's going to be basically, as Marjorie said, it's just a demonstration. And then after we're finished, we can provide some time uh, after the recording to help you with some particular questions you may have. So we're going to talk a little bit about why it's important, how California stacks up in the disability department uh, nationwide, and I want to teach you to fish. So we're going to kind of move forward under that uh, premise. And then finally, I'm going to do a live demonstration on uh, Microsoft accessibility checker, and then we'll have some time to practice. Now, I just want you to understand that the Microsoft Accessibility Checker is specific to Microsoft products. Uh, I will not be doing anything with any other products such as Google Tools or any others. Um, there have been some in the past, but pretty much Microsoft is here to stay. So the why. Um, According to the World Health Organization, over a billion people live with a disability. And this ranges from, you know, 360 million have some sort of hearing disability to 386 million people uh, overall work with some kind of a disability. Now, in the United States, that number is a little lower. 61 million adults in the United States live with some kind of disability. And that's basically one in four. Okay, that's 64%, one in four, or sorry, 26%. I'm inverting my numbers there. And California follows very closely. And by follows very closely, I'm, I'm saying to that national average. The slide here is giving you um, the different categories of disability between mobility, cognition, independent living, hearing, vision, self-care. And the tan colors are representing the types of disabilities within the United States as a whole. And the blue um, charts or bars there are giving you California's percentage of disabilities for each of those categories. So, you know, everybody's like, well, nobody, nobody has a disability in my classroom. And I would challenge that because we don't always know. Um, and something as simple as wearing glasses, such as what I'm doing right now, um, I need assistive technology, right? The glasses to help me see. So it is something that we all should be very aware of. And not only that, it's the law. Okay, there have been several different types of lawsuits and, and efforts by the federal government, different um, types of applications within the states. But basically, you know, we're looking at Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. Now, that was done in 1973, but in 2017, it, there was a big revision that by January of 2018, um, all federal contractors, so keep that in mind, most of you are in state districts or school districts or something like that, you're going to have little different rules. But um, we as OTAN, uh, we are contracted through the state of California with federal money. So this is kind of our frame that we have to provide compliance with something called WACAG, which is WAC, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines of 2.0 and AA. Now, don't worry about knowing all that. It's just, just know that this is a law that's been in effect and we have to provide um, 
our content in a form that is accessible under those rules. Now, there are other laws, including the Americans with Disabilities Act and and then, of course, the WCAG that I just mentioned. The object of today is, is to give you the necessary tools using Microsoft to meet these requirements as best as possible. This is not something that you should feel like you should have to go back and do everything over again. That's not what I'm saying, but I am saying by this awareness, you can now move forward and you can provide your teachers, your learners, your administrators, your staff with some guidelines and ideas of how they can ensure that documents are accessible, as well as any of your learners who may have a disability, they can be offered an equivalent experience to something that may or may not be accessible to them because of a disability that they may have. So I mentioned earlier that I really want to teach you to fish, okay? And that means that you get those tools so you can fill your own tackle box with the tools that you need in the type of work that you do. Um, I come from a teaching background. I was 12 years in the classroom and I shudder to think how poorly my handouts were not accessible. Um, not only was I providing them in a printed form, but I provided them in a digital form and they were woefully unacceptable. Um, so now I want you to have those different tools to ensure that whether you're providing a paper handout to your learners or you're posting um, documents on your website that you can provide that equivalent experience. Now, I don't know how many of you have a disability where you may or may not use assistive technology, but one of the things that seem to bring this um, issue to light for teachers is to understand how our learners who use assistive technology interact with our content. So I have a short video here that is only about two minutes long. And it's basically to kind of give you an, uh, a simulation of how screen readers interact with documents. So let's just pause for a second here for two minutes. Um, Marjorie, let me know if we have any audio issues, please. People often ask what difference it makes if a document is accessible or they say they know that there is no one with a disability that will be receiving their content. There are no guarantees. Documents are often shared among others. You don't want an inaccessible document attributed to your name or your company. Additionally, many accessibility features actually benefit and improve the reading experience for everyone. Today we want to simulate what someone who uses a specific type of assistive technology, a screen reader, encounters when they access a poorly structured document. Then we'll show you what their experience is like once the document has been made accessible. Keep in mind that screen readers are just one type of assistive technology. There are many different types of disabilities and subsequently many varying technologies for people to use and experience content. In this video, Cami, one of our Section 508 specialists, is going to walk you through two scenarios to demonstrate the impact of creating accessible materials. First, take a look at this PDF. We have colored large text, graphics, a process flow, lists, and link text. What else do you see? Now we're going to simulate using a screen reader by covering up the document. This is how someone using a screen reader would experience it. Interacting with kids. Kids could be of any age. Sing a song. All the king's horses and all the king's men could put Humpty together again. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great small semicolon. Have a treat. Select a graphic item. Bullet French graphic fries. Bullet ice graphic cream. Enjoy the graphic flavor. Travel to graphic McDonald's. Activities of play. Try some of these colon. Play a board game. Make a paper plate mask. Go to the park. Send us an email to get more great ideas. Logo.jpg. Was that what you expected to hear? Was all the content read? Clearly, this page was not created in an accessible manner. Now let's listen to how the screen reader interprets the content now that we've remediated the document. Graphic ABC Interactive Logo. Panic Level 1 Interacting with Kids. Kids can be of any age. Panic Level 2 Sing a Song. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall semicolon. All the king's horses and all the king's men could put Humpty together again. 
Heading level 2 have a treat. Graphic acquiring the treat process. See next page for full description. Heading level 2 activities and play. Try some of these colon. List of three items. Start bullet play a board game. Start bullet make a paper plate mask. Start bullet go to the park. List end. Send us a link email to get more great ideas. You should have noticed that the screen reader said heading before the colored phrases. The graphic had a meaningful description and was read in the proper order at the top of the page. The column content was read in the proper order. There was a list that included the number of total items. A link was indicated so that we can activate it with the keyboard. And our process flow had a brief description, but indicated that there's a long description available. So that you can review one method of handling complex graphics, we're going to show you one example of how to handle the graphic in this document. Heading level two, acquiring the treat process. List of three items. One dot travel to McDonald's. Two dot select an item. List of two items nesting level one. A dot french fries. B dot ice cream. List at nesting level one. Three dot enjoy the flavor. A numbered list structure was used to show order and a sub list helps identify the hierarchy of the content. Hopefully you can see how important it is to structure your content. This kind of structure can be applied to all Office documents in PDF. Okay, what'd you think about that? Give me some information in the chat because this is something that a lot of folks, they never hear what a screen reader sounds like or they haven't used one. And understanding this process of structure is really important. So we're going to do this through using the Microsoft tools. And I put on this slide, literally, Microsoft is your friend. Because basically at this moment, it's currently leading and provi providing accessibility tools for the production of documents. And we're it's great for, for learners. If you're a te teaching and like word processing, it's always good to teach your uh, students uh, to learn how to use this tool. It's also great for us as creators to understand, you know, why it's important to provide this type of service to our, um, our learners, as well as, you know, teach our other teachers how to do this. Now, basically, this tool provides errors, warnings, and tips. And as we go through this, um, in terms of looking at what are errors. And these are the ones we really want to fix, the errors, okay? But warnings and tips are meant like, you know, it's you really should fix a warning, but sometimes you can't. And I'll try to show you an example of that. Um, and then tips are just that. It's like helping you find ways to make your document more accessible. Now, I want to point out that this check accessibility tool in Microsoft, it's really great it does a lot, but it doesn't do everything. And so I'm going to give you another tool toward the end of the session today to consider using, especially if you are a teacher that really loves to use lots of color, colorful graphics, or text boxes that have a background and a foreground color, or background color for the fill, and the text is a different foreground color. It's very important to consider our vision um, learners and their um, potential for colorblindness of some kind. And I have a tool to help you measure that color contrast. So the other piece that's real important that we'll try to do within the demo, if there's enough time before uh, the end of the OTAN text talks, is also what are called the slide content placeholders in PowerPoint. They work very much in, uh, in tune with like a style in Word, which I will show you, um, to allow you to know that you are placing your content in a structured format, okay? So um, we can move on then to the next item here, which is going to be um, a demonstration. So I'm gonna just pause my share for just a moment and I'm gonna switch over to my other screen here. I hope, I hope, I hope. So I have uh, two documents here that I will talk about. Um, and now I'll need somebody to give me a thumbs up 
uh, and yes, Josh, um, everybody will agree with your statement. Um, and that has to do with a lot of different issues that we can't fix. So that's something where, uh, again, structuring your document can be much more helpful. Um, on the left side here, I have a document that starts with an introduction. And then I use what's called Latinized text because I don't want us to get you know, uh, distracted by reading the content of this document. So you can see that I have, um, you know, separate paragraphs and I have a graphic and I have a couple of tables and then I have an image at the end. So in Microsoft Word, and apologize for the scroll here, I'm going to go up and use this tool called the Accessibility Checker. The Accessibility Checker is on your ribbon under Review. Now I have it selected here under Review, and I'm going to go to the Check Accessibility button here on that ribbon and simply click it. Now what happens is, oh, gee whiz, my Accessibility Checker shows up over here on the left-hand side, and it says, huh. No accessibility issues found. People with disabilities should have should not have difficulty reading this document. Well, you'll notice in that previous um, clip that the accessibility checker was very careful once the document was corrected to offer you um, levels or headings. Now, if this document, pretend for a moment, was 50 pages long and it had you know, an introduction, executive summary, and on and on and on, all these different headings. I would have to listen to all 50 pages through my screen reader before I got to where I wanted to go, which may be, you know, at the, at the very end where it is recommendations for future whatever. So I really want to use the built-in tools in Microsoft, and I'm not talking about the accessibility checker here, I'm talking about using styles. So just think a moment about how many of you will select text and you'll you'll change it to bold and maybe you'll change the font size, you know, to 20 and you'll go, oh, good. That's visually, it's bigger, people can see it and everything else. The screen reader still looks at it as plain old text. All you did was make it bold and make it bigger. The screen reader does not differentiate between bold, italic, underlined, 10 point, 25 point. It just sees that as text. So you have not fixed the problem of being able to allow individuals to navigate within their document. Additionally, using styles within Microsoft Word allows you a very quick way to create a table of contents with a click. And I personally have done very long reports and I used to have to do table of contents manually. And then the editor would come along and make a change, and totally mess up my total, my table of contents. I don't care about that anymore with Word because by using styles, I can not only allow a screen reader, somebody who's using a screen reader to navigate quickly through it, I can edit those styles very quickly across the entire document, and I can create a table of contents in the matter of a couple of clicks. So let's apply some of these headings and see what happens. The accessibility checker isn't really gonna change that much here. I will tell you that because it doesn't see a problem even though I'm not applying headings. I have personally sent a note to Microsoft saying, you really need to change that. You need to identify and tell people use styles to help people navigate through the document. So I'm going to undo all those changes that I just did. And I'm going to go back to my home tab on the ribbon. And you'll see in this middle section here, styles. I'm going to simply use the default styles in Microsoft know that you can change them, you can create your own, you can make them different colors, you can do whatever you want with them. I'm just gonna use the built-in ones for purposes of time. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my little accessibility checker. Hopefully everybody can see this okay. I know that our screens are a little different sometimes. And I'm not seeing anything in the chat, so I think we're good. So I'm gonna just select this and through my styles on my shortcut bar here, I can choose what style I want to apply. I'll apply heading one, change the color. I get this little triangle indicator here that tells me visually as the creator that I applied a style. And I'll come down to these other ones. And I'm sorry, I just, just noticed I misspelled. 
executive, but we'll just pass right on by that. And I'm going to apply styles here. And you know what? I'm getting a little lazy. So I'm going to use my control key. And I think that was the last. Nope, I have another one here. And I'm going to select that second heading. And I have two headings selected here. And I'm going to apply heading two to both of them. So now everything has a heading. And if I go back to my review bar, my review ribbon, and I choose my accessibility checker, I'm going to get the same message. But I know in my mind that I now have applied styles that will allow someone using a screen reader, they'll be able to hear heading one, and they can jump directly to the next heading, heading two, heading two, heading two, heading two, and they'll hear heading two, data collection and analysis. And they'll go, oh, I want to listen to this part. They can skip everything else, whether it's on page two or 202. They have the control with that screen reader to navigate. Now, from here, I may have other items such as, oh, maybe my chart. Notice it didn't say anything about my chart. One thing you need to be careful of in Microsoft Word is that when you put in a um, image or a chart, it wants to look for what's called alt text. Now on this image, you'll notice the screen checker said nothing about this image. It, nope, it's okay. The reason why is, is Microsoft employs artificial intelligence, <clears throat> which might be an interesting uh, phrase in and of itself, but it will go through and say, ooh, I'm going to tell you what this image is. And if I select this image, and I can do this a couple of ways, I use my right mouse button because it's fast. And I'm going to come down here and look at edit alt text. Now, what happens over here in my little panel is that I see, oh, this was automatically generated. But does this description, a person posing for the camera, really say what's going on in this image? I personally don't think so. She's not posing for the camera. She's looking surprised at something that she sees on her cell phone. So I would change it. Now, if I were to delete this, Okay, I'm going to close this. And now my accessibility checker goes, uh-oh, you don't have alternative text on this picture. And it's named picture one. And in the accessibility checker, it comes down and it tells you why should you fix this uh, second screen. So by this now with that change, I removed that artificially uh, Im implanted, embedded description. Now the accessibility checker says, oh, wait a minute, you need to fix this because I need to have something that tells my individuals using a screen reader, what is this image? And the accessibility checker underneath here will give you the steps to fix that problem. So I will right click on the object and then select edit alt text, which you saw me do just a moment ago. And I'm going to provide that new alternative text. Woman looking surprised at what she sees, whoops, sees on her mobile phone. Does that sound like a better description than somebody posing for the camera? So once I close this, now my accessibility checker says, I'm fine. Everything is peachy. But I want you to understand that I've also provided alt text on my, uh, my uh, chart. So if I look at this, whoops, here, I have provided a descriptor, bar chart showing threshold percentages across age groups, 18, 25, 25, 50, and 50 and above. Now. You should also provide that same data in a table. Now, some people say, no, if I describe my chart well enough, I shouldn't have to do that. And that will be in that is a personal decision. But if you look at these two, two tables that I put in here, each one passed accessibility. The key thing with accessibility in a table, no empty cells, no merged cells. And then the screen reader will read it fine from left to right. So the screen reader is going to read sample age, number below threshold, number above threshold, second row, 1825, 75%, 20%. So the person at the screen reader is trying to have to remember what was the first column, what was the second column, what was the third column. So if you reverse it 
and change the way that the that the person experiences this data through a screen reader, now that screen reader is going to read sample age 18 to 24, 75% below threshold, 20% above threshold. Next row, sample age 25, 26 to 50. 45% below threshold, 50% above threshold, which is a better experience for someone who's using assistive technology? I'll leave that to you, okay? I personally like this one, but people reading this will go, what? So, you know, it, we, we have to kind of get over this mindset of we're all, vis we're all visually oriented. What we see on the page is what's happening, but that's really not the case for that 25% of individuals who may be using assisted devices in some way, including a screen reader. So being able to provide the information that can be interpreted in multiple ways, I believe is very important. So now this document, what are the things that I have done? I've applied my styles. I have ensured that my alt text on my images and my charts are accurate. And now I can look at this document and go, you know, I, I can believe this statement, no accessibility issues found because I've employed those tools that will help. And I'll just give you an idea of how um, valuable using styles can be. I'm going to go back to my home screen here and I'm going to, at the top of this page, I'm going to insert a table of contents. Okay. Um, Mandalay, no, there is not. Um, the only way that the um, that the screen reader can be adjusted um, is typically with different languages. Some languages read right to left. So I have not seen an example where you can force it on tables to read by column, but it's something we can look into. So I want to now show you how quickly you can use styles to make your document much more navigable for anybody else by putting in a table of contents. Now, when I want to do that, I'm going to come up here up under references on the ribbon. And on the far left side, this might be hidden just a tab, is my table of contents. And I have different varieties here, and you can make custom ones and all kinds of things. But I'm just going to make an automatic table of contents by clicking this. Boom. There's my table of contents. How hard was that? What's nice about it is that if I go in and I make a change like, OK, I can't stand this spelling error anymore. I look at this and I go, OK, I've spelled it correctly. And when I come up to my table of contents, wait a minute, it didn't fix it until I update it. So when I click in my this gray space of my table of contents, I see this little button up here that says update table. And all I have to do is click that and I can either update the page numbers because I know I made a change that shifted my page numbers or I can update everything, which includes how these headings were spelled and I can click OK. Now it's properly spelled. Also, they are all hyperlinked. So in the Word document, I can hold down my control key. Now let's pretend this is 220 pages long and I can jump immediately to that heading to get me to where I want to go, all right? Now, if I change any of my headings, if I change this, the, what I've written, all I need to do is update my table of contents. Very straightforward, very um, simple to do, but most of us are not trained to use the tools within Microsoft Word. We just learn how to make it look like we want it to look like. Now I want you to consider use the tools such as styles to help you not only make it look like you want it to look, but allow others who may use assistive technology to navigate within that document freely. Okay, that's Microsoft Word. Now I'm going to pause my share here for just a second and get up some other documents because we're going to take a little peek at Microsoft PowerPoint. So let me see if I can get this up. And I want you over here. Come on, come over here. You're not going to come over here. OK, we might have to do this a little different way. Let me see if I can pull this over. Sorry for the I think you're you're getting a blank screen, aren't you? We're actually still seeing your Word document. Yeah, OK, so I'm trying to get. 
my PowerPoint document to come. I have two screens here, guys. So I'm that's why I'm looking way over here because it's like five miles away. Let me see if I can. Okay. She's actually got one long screen. <laughs> yeah. She's got one of so those. So sorry. Okay. Now what I'm gonna do. We see your because, PowerPoint. Okay. So I'm going, I'm gonna need to expand the um the space here because I want you to be able to see this. And I'm going to so help me out, Marjorie, to make sure that we're seeing what we need to see. Are we seeing these side by side? That's what I want. Uh, two PowerPoint side by side, yes. Okay. Now, I just want you to look at these. Um, I'm going to go through each one and the different sides, slides, sorry. And you tell me, do, we're, we're relying on vision. I know. Come on, switch over. Here we go. And here's slide three. Slide three. Slide four, slide four. Do you see any difference between these two documents? Now, I'm gonna go into one and I'm going to run the accessibility checker and we will see what it says. So again, it's under review and I'm gonna check accessibility. And here's my, oh, oops, oops. I got four errors, missing slide titles. Wait a minute, all of these slides have titles, don't they? Keep that in mind. I'm going to go to the other slideshow, which is over here on this side, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to go and check accessibility. Oh, I got different results. Huh. Here I got no errors. I only got, um, I'm sorry, I got one error, excuse me, and a warning. So I have to go and look at these, but I, my first thought is, well, why does this one on the right say that all of my slides are missing a slide title? This is a slide title, but it really isn't. Because what happened is that whoever created this PowerPoint presentation used blank slides and created text boxes. And the accessibility checker says, well, this is just a text box. I don't know what it, it's not a title because the person creating this presentation never used the tools available within PowerPoint, their document more accessible. And in this case, it is those placeholders that you see all the time when you come into Microsoft PowerPoint and you go to insert a new slide and you get this, click to add title, click to add title. Those are the PowerPoint placeholders. They are the styles of PowerPoint. This is where you can put in your information and it will, it will, PowerPoint will recognize, oh, this is the title of the slide because that's what the screen reader is, reads, excuse me, that's what the screen reader reads. So when you don't use the title placeholder and you use a text place, a text box placeholder, like we have on the other side, the screen reader is going, I don't know where to go. I don't know which is first or what is second. So rule number one, always try to use the placeholders provided in PowerPoint. And a lot of times what I'll hear teachers say is like, well, I don't want that there. I want it somewhere else. Well, you can move them, you can resize them, they're still the placeholder and Microsoft will recognize it as the title slide. And hopefully that part makes sense. But let's try to fix some of these other things in this document on the left, the demo document, and to ensure that we can fix those errors that we have and we can fix some issues with this hard to read text section. So I'm gonna delete this slide because I don't need it. And I'm going to click on this missing alternative text. When I do so, I see this is saying, well, there's a diagram on slide five. So when I click it, it brings it up for me. And how many of you use this type of art in PowerPoint? This is what they call uh, um, smart art. And it's traditionally never good <laughs> because there's an issue with the color contrast. Now I'm going to open up and I didn't have it open before I started. So I'll open it now. Um, I have a color and color contrast analyzer, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. I hope as it opens. 
because these are things that the Microsoft Accessibility Checker does not check. So it's up to you as the creator to do so. Now, um, we will post the link to this color contrast analyzer. I'm just going to quickly show you how it works. First and foremost, it checks the foreground color and it checks the background color. You can do so using this little um, dropper to pick the color that you're working on. So that's the same on both the foreground and the background color. It gives you a sample preview of what you're doing. And then it gives you the results. And notice it says WCAG 2.1. And then it has some minimums here. Now, with the example that's selected here, white background, black foreground, or white background, black text, it says, yep, everything passes because it has a high enough contrast. But when I use this picker here, and I'm going to go and pick over here on my text in my, um, uh, whoops, I moved my mouse, sorry, the text in my um, uh, little triangle here, well, I, I get white, and now I'm going to come and get my background color, which is this background. Notice what happened at the bottom of the results here. It says, uh-oh, uh-oh, Everything failed. Everything failed. Okay, I didn't. I didn't make it for double A. I didn't make it for triple A. I didn't even make it for just graphics. It says no, no. This is hard to see. And what's nice about the color contrast um, analyzer is that I can look under view here and I can choose a color blindness simulation. Now I don't know if you know anybody who is colorblind. But this can be very useful for you to see when people suffer these different types of color blindness. They have low red, low green, low blue, no blue, no green, no red, and how it may or may not be easier to see. Okay, so to fix this, I have to get this ratio up where I get a pass down here, at least for my minimum double A. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to change my text. I'm going to select all this. Whoops, sorry. Sometimes my mouse does not cooperate with me. Marjorie and I were talking about that earlier. And I'm going to go and I'm going to change my color to black. And now I know there may be howls of protests where people say, well, wait a minute, I really like these colors. Well, you're going to have to make a decision you, and, and choose, choose wisely, as I would say, right? So I'm going to choose now to use my little picker again, and I'm going to come over here to my, um, my text on my graphic. And now I see, oh, I did better. OK, I'm meeting my double A requirements, and that has to do with these ratios. And there's a whole bunch of tutorials on these ratios. I'm not going to go over them. I just like this because I either pass or I don't. And I know that it will pass for user interface components on graphical objects, which is what I'm trying to meet here. So I'm hoping this this makes makes sense because there's many of us that love to use color, but sometimes what we don't understand is that by changing the font color, we may be making it very difficult for somebody else to read our text because they have a situation of color blindness to be able to see it. And we have the same thing over here with this text box. I don't know if it's very easy for you to read, but I would always test something like this. So again, it's the same process where I'm going to choose the foreground color, which in this case is going to be the same, but I'm going to demo it again. I'm going to grab that little, little dropper and I'm going to come over here and pick my color. And then I'm going to come and grab my background color. And I'm going to see, oh, wow, I just failed across the board. Whoop. So what am I going to do now? Right, I got to fix it. So I could try fixing it. This is just a plain text box. So if I tried fixing it with like, I don't know, what would you think would look better? Should I try white and then see what happens with that color? Again, I could come and grab that color. Ooh, my mouse is just not helping me today. When I select that color, I, I pass my minimum AA requirements. I pass my UI components. This fail for regular te text is really tough because these are the, the newer, more stringent um, standards under WCAG. They're not fully in place yet and not everyone needs to meet these requirements, but it's really nice to see how you compare across the board. 
So now we've gone through Microsoft Word, the accessibility checker, using styles, looking at the alt text that it provides because sometimes it's not accurate, looking at how perhaps you could offer data in a chart in a different format in order to allow somebody who's using a screen reader to have a better understanding of what that chart data means. And then also um, making sure that when, by using styles, you can see how you have greater flexibility in using these tools for all kinds of reasons. The table of contents to me is just amazing. Um, and then switching to Microsoft Power, we have the same concept with using placeholders, right? And placeholders do a fine job. And we do have a, um, a an accessibility checker that tells me here, well, I'm missing alternative text on this item. And I'm going to go ahead and do the same process of putting in a, um, oh, sorry, let me get to find it here putting in alternative text. I'm going to add a description and I'm going to, again, it's going to be, you know, a list item for the best chocolate. Now, chocolate isn't even mentioned here, but chocolate's on my brain right at the moment. So now when I go back, I only have one warning and it's again going to that same diagram. I would need to change these two additional items to make sure that all of my color contrast is working correctly. And I'll change this to black like I did the others. And I'll bet you, at least I hope I'll bet you, that my um, warning will go away and I now receive my no accessibility issues found. Thank you, Penny, for a great presentation. And OTAN would also like to thank all of you for coming to this Tech Talk. If you'd like to present a tech tool or have some tips to share with your colleagues in adult education, uh, send OTAN an email with your idea to support at OTAN.us. We also encourage you to subscribe to the OTAN YouTube channel where you can view archived tech talks um, as well as some other OTAN videos. Also check out the OTAN website at www.OTAN.us for even more resources. And we hope to see you all at future OTAN tech talks.